Guten Abend allerseits. Yeah, good evening and welcome here at the Science uh, Academy in Berlin. And uh, we no longer used to have a speech before the speech before the speech, but today is a little exception because we are meeting here at the WZB because uh, um, this uh, um, center played a somewhat important role in the digitalization of Germany. This is uh, the place where the first um, research groups were set up that dealt with the Internet. And this was created in 1993 and um, it um, started uh, a, a, a first uh, research project uh, sponsored by uh, VW Foundation. It uh, was called Culture, Cultural Space Internet, and it shed light on the Internet from an ethnographical point of view. I was a member of this research group, and I was uh, among the first who dealt with the Internet here at this research center. And I like to tell the story uh, of how I spent whole nights here at the center to deal with the different communication services, and to have a look into them. And uh, what was uh, the, the the game Pong was very popular. This was run on a server in Boston, and uh, we played a kind of um, ping pong table tennis here um, across uh, the, um, the 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 aisle of our research building here and tested the speed with which data was transmitted and we were fascinated by that also because we didn't think uh, we never thought about how fast it is possible to transmit voice via uh, the phone and uh, we were captured by what is called the internet exceptionalism I mean the idea that everything uh, changed with the internet and internet uh, must be completely different in terms of infrastructure than all uh, from, than all other infrastructures well so this was one of the cradles of uh, German internet research in the sociological area and, and therefore I'm very happy that uh, we have that we are able to provide this hall here for this uh, lecture series which uh, started 20 years later so I want to leave everything else to Toby Müller, who will introduce uh, to us uh, today's speaker. Well, thank you uh, to Janet Hofmann. And uh, you, we can see that the, in, uh, the Internet is not so much uh, different from other infrastructures in Germany because we do not have a live stream today. So uh, um, this is not the fault of the people here, but there seems to be another problem, a problem with the firewall and so on. And uh, But we have no live stream tonight, uh, well, and that is uh, why we have this uh, slight delay. But there, uh, we will have a recording, which uh, you will then later on find find on the website of the institutions and also on YouTube. The two institutions uh, are the Humboldt uh, Institute for uh, the Internet and Society and the Federal Agency for C Civic Education. So thank you for having invited me. And this is the lecture series, Making Sense of the Digital Society. And these two institutions have been organizing this. This is the second night in this year. And the uh, second, uh, the third one will follow in uh, on the 16th of October. And with what my, um, um, we, we talked about uh, uh, smart cities, um, um, uh, with Rob Kitchen, this was how we navigate our way around the cities and so on. So this was about uh, infrastructures. Today we will also talk about infrastructure, namely what is the uh, public infrastructure for money and what is the private infrastructure for money and where do they get together. And on the 16th of October we will have Kim Schäppele, uh, who um, prior to the U.S. election will talk about digital surveillance and the dismantling of democracy. She will talk about um, 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 he, she, she would speak in English, um, and uh, tonight is quite an exception because uh, this is a, a lecture in German. So if you need one now, now would be the time to get that. Then fahren wir wieder auf Deutsch. So we'll continue in German. To, to, so today it's about um, everyday things. Um, things that uh, most of us will probably do several times a day, often not in Germany. 
uh, because uh, we'll talk about digital payments or what the technological and above all the political importance of it is. So you may know that and I think at the moment uh, the world is somewhat uh, um, uh, uh, surprised to see how difficult it is to pay digitally in Germany. There are lots of articles in the, in the Guardian, in the New York Times and so on and people uh, are wondering why it is so difficult to pay digitally in, in Germany. About seven years ago I was in London and I felt ignored by the Brits there because uh, they paid even small amounts of money with their uh, smartphone and I had coins in my pockets and uh, caused delays and the queues you probably know that also from when when you go to Brandenburg and are no longer able to um, uh, reopen a rental car with through your app because there is no network coverage there and I think one of the most uh, or the worst mistakes by the Merkel government was uh, that um, when, when the license was awarded for mobile phone coverage that um, it was that it wasn't really made compulsory that there would be coverage everywhere so digitalization is difficult and it will be a top of the agenda in Germany and in Europe on the uh, um, for the time to come so we'll do without excessive internet today we have no slide or this participatory tool through which you can ask questions and uh, so we also have no live stream this was a result of the pandemic we no longer need the live stream because you are here an uh, uh, audience uh, uh, thank you for having come. There are two microphones. You can ask questions after the lecture, and I will, I will try to enter into a discussion with our speaker for about 15 or 20 minutes. And after that, there will be time. The, the floor will be open for you. But also afterwards, uh, using the hashtag Digital Society, you can um, join in into the discussion even afterwards. So, of course. One can complain about um, the weaknesses uh, of our um, uh, infrastructure. This has become a national pastime, so to say. Uh, but uh, we can also, as we do it very often this series, uh, we can could also do a different, take a differentiated stance and uh, um, see how digital systems have changed our lives. Uh, um, they make um, their usability is undisputable. They make our life more comfortable. But today we'll focus more on the power relationships and also on power shifts. Uh, uh, how much of that uh, comes with the new and announced technologies of money uh, with their um, storage media, the institutions and supervisory um, bodies. Uh, much uh, comes um, um, and, and the commercial companies behind them. But uh, today this is not this this is not only about PayPal and Apple Pie. No Apple pay so there will be some snacks after the lecture here for all of those who will stay with us but we'll talk also about new projects that point towards the future like the digital euro uh, and how this diff is different uh, from cryptocurrency so paying with your smartphone uh, digital euros cryptocurrency so what is the difference um, uh, there are lots of differences but also some things that they have in common so where does a european sovereignty start so this is a, a new project of the European uh, Union and what will the new role of the central banks be and also of the European Central Bank. You all know the tall building in Frankfurt, which is very awe-inspiring, I believe, um, in Frankfurt. And uh, this will lead, leave, lead to new power relationships and to a shift in power. So these are only some of the questions that our guest uh, will describe more in detail. I've just mentioned some of the buzzwords to make you more curious and to distract you for 19 minutes from football and to distract you also from all uh, all those things uh, that football is distracting us at the moment. But there's no football match tonight. The football will continue only on Friday with a match with the uh, German um, team. Our speaker is on loan uh, from the Justut, uh, Just, um, by the Justus Liebig University in Gießen to the Technical University in Darmstadt. She is a fellow at the Institute for Sociology at the T Technical University in Darmstadt and uh, supports the Young Investigator program there at the Center for Responsible Digitality. She leads a research project on financial infrastructure and geoeconomic security and on money as data. And uh, we will hear some of 
some of the results of uh, the research. And, and um, she, she works together with two colleagues from Groningen in the Netherlands and Frankfurt. And together with them, she is publishing a handbook on global financial infrastructures, which will be printed this year by Cambridge Inter University Press. So everything else, or almost everything else, uh, is what you will hear from her firsthand. A warm welcome to Carola Westermeyer. Yeah, ganz Thank you very much for these warm introductory words and for inviting me here to Berlin to this great uh, lecture series. So we've already heard that there is currently no way around football these days. In football and money, that's something we could talk about at great length. We all know that the two are closely intertwined. That's well known. Money has not only dominated, but obviously also corrupted the large Football organizations is also a topic of topic of much debate. But what has caught many people's eye during this European Championship is money in the form of sponsoring, and specifically sport sponsoring here on the perimeter boards. The sponsors this year include the Chinese payment provider, Alipay, that is also the official payment partner. A brief explanation, Alipay is a platform with an electronic wallet that allows you to send money and make online and offline purchases. That payment providers sponsor large sporting events, that's nothing new. Before it was Visa and MasterCard, for example, here on the perimeter of boards. And according to estimates, they have invested more than $100 million in sports sponsorship. So before it was the credit card companies, and now it's the electronic payment provider, Alipay. We could interpret whether this change in the, on the perimeter boards indicates an epochal change from the card, credit card to the digital wallet from US companies to Chinese competitors. And where is Europe in all this? Is the European Football Championship now a metaphor that Europe is indeed providing the playing field, but others are doing business on this playing field? I think that would probably be over-interpreting the football analogy, but it does hint at what triggers us to think about money and the larger implications and context. And that's what I want to do in the following. My approach is reflected in the title of today's lecture. It's about understanding money as a digital technology. It's about changing, shifting the perspective of how we talk about money. We talk about money a lot, um, it's often about the quantity, how much money does a person have. But today I want to talk about money without focusing on the quantity. I want to shift our perspective to looking at money as a socio-technical system. And I want to discuss how this also restricts relationships. What this approach means is that we go beyond the technical aspects of tools and instruments, but we want to show how money is a technology that is closely intertwined with social, political, and economic factors. The development of money as a technology is influenced by society, societal structures and vice versa. So money influences these structures too. So when we analyze money as a technology, it's about more than artifacts. Physical objects, concrete materialities of money are part of the technology. But this perspective also means more than the tangible aspects of technology, also the knowledge, the practices, the social structures that surround money. We have to be clear about one thing when we use a technology that is dependent on the context and not determined by the possibilities for innovation of a technology. So the use of a technology is not determined by the technical characteristics, but also shaped by social factors. This includes the users, institutions, societal norms, and so on. In the following, I want to 
focus on two different but interconnected contexts to show how money as a technology shapes social and political relationships. The first one is talking about the role of money as a data carrier and then the geopolitical implications of financial infrastructures that enable the circulation of money. Then I'd like to draw your attention to an emerging form of money, the central bank digital currencies and specifically the digital euro. So let us begin with money as a data carrier. I mentioned Alipay at the beginning. It's hardly used at all in Europe. If it's used, then it's used, for example, by tourists from Asia at the airport in Frankfurt, but in Germany, it's usually the US American company PayPal that is more dominant when it comes to online payments. And PayPal recently made an interesting announcement. At the end of May, the business announced that it would be using customer data for expanding its advertising business. It wants to use the data of its existing customers to do this. And the thought is nothing new, but it's really about expanding what the business, what the company is doing already. Already now, the company is sharing customer data with more than 1,000 other companies. And we've become quite OK with that. So when we move around online, we are aware that our data get collected. Foucault Healy talks about the logic that data have to be collected. Um, and as we do that assuming that monetarization will then occur. And this also applies to data. But there's one difference when it comes to these transaction data. Transaction data is considered particularly valuable, and PayPal knows this, because this data allows us to draw conclusions on the personal life and actual behavior of individuals. Typically, transactional data include a timestamp, locational data, account data of the beneficiary, a description of the purchase, and the amount of money. So not just the amount of money that was spent. This transaction history enables detailed insights into the most personal information. For example, a monthly transfer indicates that this might well be the salary and that uh, this also includes data about the employer. Payments to public institutions often include social security numbers or uh, tax IDs. Spending habits show our links to political, religious organizations. Medical transfers um, can include sensitive information, for example, about our illnesses. So, in short, transaction data are more informative and meaningful than, for example, social media data. Whether I like a post by a political group or support this group with regular donations, this is a huge difference. PayPal is also well aware of this difference, and they say that themselves. They say, with almost 400 million active accounts and the scope of PayPal transaction data, we, PayPal, are in a unique position to shape a new era of trade relations and help traders to, ga to gain new customers and retain existing customers. So these are the pro also the promises of the data economy, the promise to use targeted analysis to expand business areas. And this also applies to the political realm. Many regulations that are defined in Brussels help data protection, but when it comes to financial transactions, there are also directives that enable the sharing of transaction data, for example, from banks to payment providers. We, the users, are then expected to consent, and that cons consent is our expression of sovereignty. And that includes reading the terms and conditions. At the same time, the commercial use of transaction data is not 
just something that happens in the 21st century. Money and transaction data as a form of a social archive were also already collected before the data economy. Companies use transaction data to rate their customers, to classify customers. An important area is credit worthiness. A lot of data is collected in this field. For example, transaction data is ex um, extracted from accounting records to predict the credit worthiness of traders and consumers, so like a proxy for other aspects of individual or business behavior. But just as in many other areas, the amount and potential availability of data has increased considerably with the rise of digital technology. In addition to the use of transaction data for commercial purposes, access to transaction data and control over payment infrastructures has another relevance, and that is a political relevance. Transaction data are also used for the area of financial security. Banks and other payment actors have been com um, required for years to report suspicious transactions to prevent terrorist financing and money laundering. Follow the money. We are aware of this. Mm -hmm. So we know the principle of follow the money because uh, money is um, uh, is something that uh, uh, is is very unlikely to be able to be traced, and it is not. Uh, it, uh, and m money, if we t speak about banknotes, is cannot tell you something about its history or about the past. Whether the twenty euros that Hannah gave to Jonas uh, yesterday are the same twenty euros that Jonas will give to Ali tomorrow, that is very difficult to trace. And this example shows very simply that, uh, in a simple way, that it is not about. Uh, um, about tracing the amount of money, but uh, about uh, this is about uh, um, providing evidence that money was paid. And if uh, money is transacted digitally, it's the data traces that are tracked um, in, and that uh, data that is stored in the storage media. And if a transaction is a suspicious uh, transaction and then was classified as a risk transaction, uh, transaction, then this is done on the basis of a risk assessment. So a transaction. A to Syria, based on this risk classification, is associated with a higher risk for terror f financing, and it is then checked, and this may take a little longer, or this transaction is not carried out. Uh, in addition to m monitoring transactions, and, uh, and banks and uh, payment, uh, um, payment service providers also implement sanctions. So in every uh, jurisdiction, we have sanction lists with uh, natural persons and organizations uh, with whom it is not allowed to have financial transactions. These checks are not only done uh, are not only done by any city bank or super regional bank, but also the biggest payment network in Europe does this as well, namely SWIFT. This is the Society for Worldwide Interbank Financial Telecommunications, located in Belgium, is an infrastructure for international payments by allowing secure bank-to-bank -bank, um, messages. And the whole discussion about uh, SWIFT in the context of the uh, sanctions against Russia is uh, very um, helpful for me. So it's, it means that I don't have to explain SWIFT anymore in so much detail. But when implementing the sanctions against Russia, this was about excluding Russian banks from this network. So this, the aim of uh, the sanctions was to, um, to, to block the connectivity that this network offers. Another uh, possibility of this uh, network is the possibility of monitoring or surveillance and the United States in the context of the war against terror uh, um, procured themselves access to the swift transaction and data and this um, meant that they procured themselves an important surveillance option uh, to trace cross-border bank transactions and so this method the United States are still in a position to check whether foreign banks comply with such international sanctions or violate them and this brings us to another important aspect and that is financial infrastructures and the analysis of money as such money systems like SWIFT 
um, are an infrastructure for economic uh, relations. Uh, they are omnipresent, they make financial uh, life possible, and they facilitate trade, uh, payment of debts, uh, transactions, and so on. But such uh, infrastructures are not neutral networks, but um, in, in but uh, such international uh, f finance infrastructures also reflect a certain power um, relations. So I re remain with SWIFT. The development of uh, SWIFT is closely linked to the economic geo and geopolitical development in the 1970s, globalization, expansion of trade relations, so power structures uh, and uh, connectivity um, that uh, characterize this uh, network. And uh, we uh, aggregated uh, maps of this uh, swift message uh, transactions shows that uh, that uh, it codes uh, colonial routes and uh, um, um, hubs of the Bretton Woods systems. And on this uh, um, map, you can see the blue areas, that is the um, core areas, and the green areas are um, periphery, at the periphery. And the gray areas often have no uh, link uh, to this network uh, whatsoever. So this is a map of 2013. And you could see the SWIFT never, has never really been a global network. When we look at the SWIFT routes and the, their functionality, uh, it uh, becomes clear that some parts of the world have always been pretty much isolated and uh, they uh, depended on uh, routes uh, via formal f f via the former colonial powers and so swift re reflects the former um, power structures and power relations and this meant that for certain areas like africa uh, middle east the functionality of uh, the swift infrastructure was always uh, precarious um, there was uh, so these maps show how certain money relations um, are given priority namely in particular those uh, between western centers and other links financial links or transaction and transactions uh, are more difficult to um, actually carry out. And um, many countries, in particular in the global south, um, were excluded for a long time from, from this financial infrastructure. So infrastructures like uh, SWIFT uh, have certain power relations inscribed in them. Um, so for many years, this um, um, sinks in, they become a sediment, so these power structures are not visible, they are not discussed, and they are simply merely accepted in our everyday uh, work. But then there are times uh, where these um, sediments and these logics uh, uh, become more visible. Often it is not just one moment when they become visible, it is often a long process of resurfacing when um, often it starts uh, so, for example, um, in the wake of the 11th of September, when the CIA and the U.S. Uh, Treasury um, um, demanded, uh, requested access to the um, 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 financial transaction databases of SWIFT in order to trace terrorist networks, and, uh, for example, uh, decoupling Iran from this network also uh, led to the resurfacing of these old uh, sediments uh, regarding power structures, um, which meant that the SWIFT network was no longer only perceived as a financial infrastructure, but also as a political infrastructure. And uh, um, so in the wake, um, d different uh, proposals and debates, uh, debates for p potential alternatives to SWIFT uh, came up. And because um, such inherent political technologies cannot be reshaped depending on the interest, uh, um, because the, such political constellations always, uh, um, the, because the procedures are, are always determined by political constellations, and uh, the. Um, the, uh, devising and designing new uh, money infrastructures are very important in this regard. The, decide, the decision which um, relations should be given priority, which control structures should be there, are um, very important because uh, they uh, need to be, uh, come part of the mat materialness of money. 
um, this is a point that is very important because uh, we are discussing the emergence of new payment systems at the moment. So money as a technology, uh, so money as uh, data, um, and uh, the um, use of transaction data for security policy reasons and the uh, geopolitical um, geopolitical importance of uh, transaction infrastructures uh, for sanctions. Um, so these are the different aspects. And I now want to um, look at the um, um, the, the different uh, perspective from different perspectives uh, on money as a technology and to uh, talk about uh, central ba bank money. So there is a public or kind of government uh, player prior, we, uh, um, before we only had uh, private companies as actors like uh, um, Alipay or, um, or PayPal and so on. And SWIFT is an, a kind of association, a network of banks. Um, and now we are moving towards a new technology um, when we talk about what is digital central bank money. So we should uh, become aware of one thing, uh, which is uh, which is which we are probably most cases unconscious of when we deal with money in our everyday life. So on the one hand side we have central bank geld, that um, central bank money. That is uh, the, the central bank guarantees the value of this money. But this central bank money is uh, something that we as citizens only have in the form of cash. And on the other hand, uh, there is digital money. So. All di digital money is private money. Um, so this is m money that is savings in banks, for example, but it's a, it is a contract between us and the bank. So this means uh, so there is a certain uh, um, degree of risk involved here. Banks can go bankrupt, and that is why we have um, these uh, bank guarantees um, for the the money saved at, at the bank. But it's a different kind of money. So with this new central digital central bank, get the following things uh, um, things happen. So the safest money that we know is the money uh, from uh, the central bank, and now we put this on a digital infrastructure and make it, uh, and with that we can circulate digitally but it's this is not just one form uh, but digital central bank money um, comes in different forms so we have retail and digital central bank money that is what we can use in our everyday sh uh, uh, shopping we have wholesale um, money and we also have a cross-border digital central bank money which uh, um, makes interaction between states possible. So cross-border, so uh, cross-border between banks in these different states. So another map, which is more colorful, and uh, this uh, shows the countries in the world that deal with uh, the topic of digital central bank money. And uh, you can see different colors here because some Countries are still well, considering that, thinking about that, pondering that, doing research. There are other countries that have progressed even more. They have carried out pilot projects. Uh, so the different stages of the development. Uh, but uh, at the moment, we have more than 130 countries who are already dealing with this uh, um, with this topic. Five years ago, this map would have been gray. Five years ago, this wasn't really a topic, although the technology was already available. What had happened, or almost has happened meanwhile, so 2019, Facebook announced that they would develop uh, their own uh, digital currency, namely Libra. So this was then discussed, and uh, this uh, was influenced by regulations in such a way that uh, uh, Facebook no longer con um, um, followed up on this. But this announcement of a big tech company uh, was a kind of uh, warning uh, alarm uh, for the central banks and the, uh, and, the com and the countries and the governments to deal with the topic of digital um, currency because this uh, was seen as a threat to their own monetary um, sovereignty, namely that there was a private company that could uh, print or issue its own money that could be used in cross-border transactions. This was uh, seen as a big risk. Um, Therefore, it was discussed, uh, and then 
why this brought some momentum into the discussion. The technology was available before that, but that was the point when uh, the um, governments said that it was necessary to deal with this topic. So one issue, one, one, one um, sentence on the cryptocurrencies, is this a cryptocurrency or not? Well, we said this is a central bank behind that. So the value of the money is guaranteed by the central bank, whereas with a cryptocurrency, one could say there's nobody behind them, or one could say the technology stands for itself, but uh, it is a technology, uh, um, the, 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 the technology of the digital central banks is similar to that of the cryptocurrencies, because uh, cryptocurrencies were started as a challenge to established monies, and now we have the most established players in the money sector come along and say, well, it's interesting, we could do the same, but in a different way, and um, they are thinking about whether they want to use the blockchain for this kind of, uh, for the, for this kind of digital currency. So Facebook announcement was the starting point, but still, the motivation the motivation uh, of these countries is very different. They um, so it differs from country to country. So we have countries of the global south who I uh, think about uh, introducing this technology for financial inclusion. Uh, parts of the population have no access to the banking system, and they should. The idea is to link them to the banking system via the smartphone. Then. Um, the idea is also to have a more efficient cross-border financial transaction systems that is important uh, for countries who depend very much on remittances, that is the payment of their um, diaspora abroad to their home countries. So often such financial transaction services uh, are very expensive or slow, and the, it is known that this could be done in a much cheaper, much quicker way, and this technology could be used for that. And uh, this then brings us to the European Union. The technology could uh, be used for uh, more control over um, payment infrastructures. And this brings us to Europe and to the digital euro. The European Central Bank uh, for 20 or well, since 2020 has been dealing with this topic in October last year. Uh, they um, went from examining an examination phase to a preparatory phase, and this is the um, release, uh, the press release on that. So the digital euro is a kind of retail um, euro, so that's something that we should be able to use in our everyday interactions um, in the shops and so on. And so here again, it, it is uh, the perceived threat that has prompted the EU to take this step. Because in Europe, this has been mentioned before, in Europe we depend very much uh, on non-European payment um, uh, actors, Visa, MasterCard, that can be used uh, uh, cross-border. They, they are the dominant uh, payment uh, um, means of payment. Um, and also in Europe, if you've booked your holiday, Day in Europe, you probably have um, booked it with Visa or Mastercard. PayPal is uh, catching up. Um, so these has been ha are developments that have been there for some time. So this uh, gained momentum under the Trump uh, government. And the idea, namely, that we should deal with this um, dependence on U.S. companies in this regard. And then uh, in 2020, there was a, a retail payments strategy. Um, the idea was, namely, namely, once relegated to the back office, payments have become strategically significant. They are the lifeblood of the European economy. So in the past, this was uh, a topic that was very much below the radar. It was not perceived as being um, politically relevant, and now it is uh, considered politically very relevant. This was in 2020, and this um, gained even more momentum uh, after uh, the um, uh, Russian aggression against Ukraine. And uh, in 2023, Christine Lagarde said, well, uh, she, 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 her remarks became more and more urgent. Uh, and in 2023, she said, well, when you look at your wallet and you look at your telephone and see uh, the applications that you use for payments or, or the cards that you use uh, for payment, you very, seen, you very soon realize that those means of payment are not necessarily European. And uh, she did a direct comparison um, with the dependence on Russian gas. Um, so, 
it's uh, it's not I cannot really quote that, but uh, but you can see the connotation here, um, which is I think quite remarkable. So these are the ideas behind this um, um, European Digital Central Bank uh, um, currency. This is uh, to bring about more resilience. Uh, this is to address these uh, dependencies, and um, and these are the promises also. Um, Mm, and at the same time, uh, this was also said, uh, they do not want to have a revolution in the financial sector. So banks uh, um, to remain there and to do their business. Um, so the digital euro was, is to be introduced in G um, apps. So it's not a revolution, but it's an incremental change on the basis of a new infrastructure. So now. We could um, have a look at that. Well, yeah, so uh, all these announcements at the European level, then talk about uh, European sovereignty. This is not a new issue. How can they actually implement that? And maybe it's quite interesting to have a look at the prototype of this uh, Euro digital euro. This is one prototype, not necessarily the basis for the final version, but uh, it's interesting because you can see the relationship between um, uh, public and private actors in the technology itself. So uh, on the top we have the back end, which is the core of the infrastructure where the transaction is stored, um, where the settlement is done, and uh, there's another component. Uh, um, so the offline bridge should be possible to pay um, also offline with the digital euro, which in particular in Germany, where sometimes you do not have internet coverage, it could be quite useful to be able to pay with that offline. But uh, this core is to be developed by the euro system. Euro, that is the uh, network of those central banks uh, that use the euro. So the German Bundesbank is part of that. And all this is coordinated by the European Central Bank. This doesn't mean that the European Central Bank uh, has uh, or will employ hundreds of IT experts and techies, but all these individual components, uh, like for example for this offline bridge, all this will be developed by private developers. There was a call at the beginning of this year for or an invitation for tender uh, for at the beginning of this year for these different uh, um, components and the overall um, dime, um, um, amount was 1.3 billion euros. So it's a big, big call for tenders and uh, companies can place their bids here and. Um, when these, um, when when the um, uh, uh, and only companies and uh, individuals from the EU can apply for that. So it could not be the subsidiary of Visa in Luxembourg that could apply uh, for that, but only European, genuinely European can. Uh, can companies, so in order to pursue this idea of European digital sovereignty. Uh, down there you, we, you can see the front end and that is what we will then see on our smartphone, the wallets, the apps with which we interact and everybody can provide that to the city banks uh, or Sparkasse, uh, um, Apple and so on. So this is interchangeable. So. Um, I can also um, change the provider of the uh, front end application wherever I want to open up a bank account. And um, I think uh, I, I, this prototype is very interesting. And the publication by the European um, Central Bank is very interesting here because this shows how the relationship between the public and the private uh, uh, players is to be designed, how the exchange is to be designed um, and established and, and so on. And uh, he, he, we can see also how European uh, sovereignty could uh, become material, could materialize. So this is not yet, uh, um, um, well, this is not uh, um, cast in iron yet, but uh, um, hasn't materialized yet, but this is how it could look like in the end. So, but uh, what about the digital euro as a data, uh, as a data carrier? So today, when we pay digitally, we do not really have a choice. 
we on, we have no choice. We must uh, um, exchange our private data with um, private um, service providers, some whom we trust more. But the only possibility that we have to ex is to exchange our data with um, private companies. With Digital Europe, we will have the possibility to exchange our data with a um, public um, infrastructure, with a public provider or government-run um, provider. And then, of course, people will have to decide whom they will trust more. So for the European um, Central Bank, it became clear that uh, privacy uh, and data protection is an important issue for citizens with, uh, in connection with digital euro. And they want to put a focus on that. And uh, so, But all this depends on the legislative process. Uh, the idea was to conclude that prior to the elections. Um, and the development of the digital euro depends on the accompanying legislative process. But the idea is to have a digital euro with the highest level of, uh, to develop the digital euro with a the highest level of privacy possible. And it's often compared to cash, um, but that's uh, this comparison is very difficult, I, f I find, because every digital transaction is traceable, and the same holds uh, true for the crypto um, Europe with the Bitcoin, and also with the Bitcoins in blockchain, it is possible to trace the transaction, and the difference is that it cannot always be um, 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 associated or, or linked to a certain, so at the moment we have, we have a situation as an account, Carola Westermeyer, and I always have to say, well, I'm Carola Westermeyer and I'm allowed to, tra to transmit this money. With a cryptocurrency, there is a kind of safe uh, with no name, but I have a key. And uh, uh, with this key, I can open this uh, safe. So these are two different ways as to how access uh, is made possible to this digital money. and. With the digital euro, um, well, the idea is to have different possibilities here. So the um, um, protection of personal data uh, uh, is something that uh, should be guaranteed by rules and provisions and also by design, by technology. And with the euro, it is important to be able to to, to to make that transparent, um, to make it transpa to make transparent how this is developed, and it would be good to have open source uh, technology so that it is understandable. Uh, um, it becomes understandable what happens with the data, and with many private companies, many private financial service providers, this is unknown. So, well, the digital euro is still a project. Uh, I think current timeline is uh, 2028. Um, that it may the introduction may start then, but I hope that um, by having this discussion, by this talk, meetings like this one here, we could maybe um, make a contribution towards uh, discussing the future of money and technology technology for money, because. Um, we know that infrastructures have um, certain uh, that the 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 logics of the time in which such infrastructures are developed are then uh, enshrined and uh, um, and kind of become manifest in these infrastructures. So we now have to think about how should we shape the relationship between government and the market, and how do we want to shape our money relationship. So it's uh, well, seemingly this topic is a topic for the future, but it is important to think about this issue now because now we may still may have the possibility to influence the discussion and to have a say in shaping this whole topic. So I would like to stop here. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Carola Westermeyer, for this talk. It doesn't always happen that I feel smarter after such a presentation. We'll find out whether I was this was delusional or not. So I'll try to come back to a few things that you mentioned in your presentation before we then look to the future. What 
needs to be done, uh, the dominant logics that are built into all of this, how we can change those logics. But I have one example, because you talked about the SWIFT system, and I'd like to compare that to what the digital euro could change. I think you mentioned two examples, Russia that was thrown out of SWIFT um, to enforce sanctions, so a power political, power policy um, politics instrument, and then the other one was uh, frictions in the transatlantic um, relationship between the US and Europe, and that was Iran. And um, they, then the US, for example, wanted to keep uh, their control uh, over information who's doing business with Iran. That was, for example, Europe. And the question was, uh, what network can we use? SWIFT can still be used to do business with Iran, or do we, as Europeans, as the Germans have to fear sanctions by the US. Would what would the role of the digital euro be in such a scenario? Would it be a step towards more sovereignty? Um, irresponsible of how you look at this from a moral or ethical point of view, but would that enable Europe, Germany to do business with totalitarian regimes that are sanctioned by others? Yeah, it's good that you refer back to the European example. So when the Europeans, when Europe was in a situation where after Trump retreated from the nuclear agreement, uh, Europe was in a position where they wanted to do business with Iran, but were not able to because the only possibility was to do this through SWIFT and many banks said, no, 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 no. The US will then see that y y we are in a trade relationship with Iran and we, f we fear the implications of that. And so the Europeans wanted to do business politically, but did not have the infrastructure to make good on this political promise. That was an important experience for Europe. So the experience of seeing, OK, so we can have plans to do certain things, but if we don't have the infrastructure to do that, then this is a problem. And that it was a realization that really hit, um, hammered home in, in Brussels. So we can't really take all of this to the digital euro because the digital euro is being developed for inter-European trade. Um, in the future, in the far future, this might also be a possibility to use it outside of Europe. But So the situation is that somebody in Washington would then say in the future, I don't want, I want to make this kind of business relationship impossible by using specific sanctions. It does not have to be a, an entire country, but maybe targeted at specific groups. So to not be in this situation of dependency anymore, that was a lesson that we learned. And with the digital euro, we are trying to solve this issue for Europe to, to, to minimize this risk of external interference. You also mentioned in your presentation that the technology has been existing for a long time, blockchain, um, first of all. Uh, but we don't know what the role of blockchain will be in the digital euro, whether it will play a role at all. And you also said that the decisive impetus from for the European Central Bank and Europe to think start thinking about a digital euro was Libra, the Facebook currency, so to speak. And that was then changed by regulation, but that was the tipping point for Europe to address the issue. So geopolitical considerations, what's their role for whether we say yes or no to increasing our independence on others. What do you think about that? Well, you've mentioned the dominant networks, and in Europe we are talking about US networks, but also China has this, uh, makes this threat that Alipay, for example, um, wants to expand to Europe. Will we then become dependent on Chinese networks? So this these scenarios of threat in the geopolitical situation 
being between the U.S. and China, this fundamental insecurity when it comes to the elections in the United States in November, what the situation will be like afterwards. That is something that now creates uncertainty, but also creates a certain pressure to take action. So this is not only, but also against big tech, but it's also about not being dependent on non-European actors. So we are talking about the US here, and I think that's remarkable that we in Europe say it's not really a situation we feel comfortable in. That does say a lot about what Europe, what people in Europe are anticipating in terms of future scenarios. So this does play a role, whether it's always the determining factor in a decision situation that I don't know, but it is something that is definitely part of that. You started out with football, Alipay, virtual board advertising. So um, those watching in China, outside of Europe, in other regions, see something else on the perimeter boards. So um, there are some exemptions to that rule. We've seen Chinese characters uh, here in Europe on TV, and that also sends a strong message of, hey, um, we, 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 we can do this. And I read in the Spiegel that 568 million euros are being spent for this by the Chinese company. So we are not talking about peanuts here. We're talking about large amounts of money. And again, we ask ourselves, when we talk about infrastructures in Europe, what has taken us so long? There were plans in the past to have a normal electronic payment system to invent something like that in Europe. And what happened? Well, what happened is that I think um, there's Twint in, in Switzerland, there's a regional system in the Netherlands, and we here in Germany keep using PayPal. Why? Why, didn't, why weren't we successful? Because there were plans to do so. Yes, there were plans and visions to do this, and the European Central Bank, Brussels, the political actors for a long time hoped, pinned their hopes to a private sector solution. There's the European Payments Initiative that started out with great ambitions, but then, and this is probably a European problem, it failed because there were issues of coordination, who will do what. There were obviously struggles between the banks involved who then got their act together again, but at the end of the day it failed. And I don't think this is a coincidence because at the moment when the private sector initiative hit its low point, the European Central Bank then took on the initiative about the digital euro. So it's it wasn't always public actors involved, but there were also hopes for a private sector solution at some point in the past. And just very recently, a short time ago, an initiative was published or a solution by a small initiative to establish something similar in Germany, something which already exists in Spain and the Netherlands. So a, a payment system that works as a national solution so for for countries that already have a functioning national system, they don't really know what the digital euro should be good for. But it is still a European, or seems to be a European problem that we can agree on, on processes and initiatives like that, first at the national level, then at the European level. So there have been these initiatives, but so far they have not been successful. I have another very specific question about the digital euro, you talked about transaction data and PayPal. So this is really a vast extent of data mining that goes way beyond what happens in social media data. It's major metadata that are being sold here uh, after the MasterCard leaks, I think, where there was a big leak um, of massive amounts of data that then showed up. Uh, I think this was about baby food and some other not very appetizing things. And you mentioned PayPal. So here we've now been, we, we've been talking a lot about the AI Act, the Digital Services Act, very complex legislative processes, but Europe is still considered somewhat something like a pioneer globally for regulating these areas. 
so how is it even possible that something like that happened here in Europe? Because we're talking about companies that also have headquarters or establishments here in Europe that are major actors in the European mar markets, and they must be aware of the Digital Services Act that prohibits things like that. Well, uh, I'm sure a lawyer would be able to explain you in detail why this was possible. Well, it is possible for companies because there's still the conviction out there that this data is great. It's great to have the possibility to analyze this data, and we don't want to keep companies from doing that. So um, this analysis of non-personal data, um, that was, for example, what happened with MasterCard. There were categories of transactions. So, for example, baby food, gambling, and other data that people didn't want to see on their credit card records. And that this data enabled them to identify target groups. So it's often like a circumvention, like bypassing, uh, not identifying a person, but a group. And these, this is a possibility for analyzing data, for, in, for making it possible to share data, so to take out this Individ individualized, personalized element. But I'm not a data protection specialist. I work with people who are experts in this field, and I understand that it's complicated. But that's why I also believe that, OK, so we do have this assumption that as data subjects, we can withdraw our consent. And that is a point that we need to talk about more, maybe, so you can withdraw your consent. But but we don't do that because we want to pay for things. We want to be part of the transaction flows and the sovereignty that is that is uh, sometimes assumed or we are told we have this by not agreeing to terms and conditions. It's it's not possible in practice. So um, it's really worthwhile rethinking this, whether sovereign data subjects um, really only have to read the terms and conditions to have the possibility to to withdraw their data. But so the terms uh, and conditions will mean that we go under. But back to the digital euro, there are a few things that I don't really understand yet. So many things still have to be negotiated. We can talk about the trade powers um, that enable that to start with, but one of the major differences compared to the cryptocurrencies, and that's something that always happens in capitalism, you integrate the major critics, it's not a new strategy, but there is one major difference, and that's the centralized ledger. So there is a central database where all these transactions, as you said, will be traceable, and the blockchain exists because to not make this possible by having these decentralized servers and not just one server that will, would then in the case of the digital euro, be in Frankfurt or wherever. But the problem that I don't understand is that the EU, the European Central Bank in this case, talks a lot, uh, it advertises its own services under the buzzword of privacy. So with a centralized ledger database where all of this would be stored, how can you promote privacy at the same time? I don't understand that because uh, I'd say uh, limitless surveillance would then also be possible. Yeah, absolutely. That's a very important point. Potentially, that would be possible. You could store everything in one database, including the real names, make everything traceable and identifiable, and that would be the dream of any surveillance state. That's the China dystopia, too, that um, they would do that there with a the digital yuan, but um, that has not taken off in China. That's a different story. So the question here is, and the devil's in the detail, because the implementation in its detail is very important here. So which data is visible for whom and what is linked to the transaction? And here the idea is that personal and private data is not linked with the European Central Bank data to start with. At the same time, there's also 
the call to um, prevent terrorist financing and money laundering. And this means that maybe the banks or some other actor will have to make sure this doesn't happen. So there are these conflicting points between privacy and the security aspects. And the question here is who will do that and at which point. There are a few suggestions out there, but I don't want to talk about them in too much detail. But the idea is to separate the two. So the ECB says we don't want to be involved in all the detail and make it traceable. And for a central bank, that's understandable. They say we are not interested in the commercial use of this data. But, and this is my opinion, they should make sure that private actors can't do so either. So here too, um, the motto now is that with your consent, using your transaction data will be possible. But it's really about separating the two. So the transactional history that is necessary for making a digit for making digital money traceable, um, and then on the other hand, my own private data. So a token would be an idea where you don't where that doesn't have your name on it, but an access ID, for example. But this is a very technical detail, but um, there are a few good ideas out there. And there's also the idea out there that this the digital euro would have to be as anonymous as cash. And in, in Germany, we can't only make fun of all that. We have to see the good sides of that too. Resilience, renitence, all these things. Um, when people say, I do want to have the possibility to make anonymous payments that are not traceable. And I think we're talking about different sums of money here. We're talking about 100 or 300 euros or larger sums of money where you could use the digital euro as completely not traceable currency. Um, our income, for example, that's not part of the banking secret because we pay taxes on our income. So what are the possibilities here to um, get involved in the negotiations? You said it yourself. It will take another four or five years until the digital year is ready. What can we do to get involved? Well, I talked a lot about digital money, and of course, we could also beat the drum for cash. And I, too, use cash for certain payments very specifically, but I also believe that we need a digital option that is as anonymous as possible. Because in some regions, and some earlier than in others, we will be in a situation where if we don't use cash, we, we, we can't go there. So cash is also about closeness. So if you don't have a pharmacy in a five kilometer radius, radius, and um, that is for an, ex an example where we need an anonymous payment method. When it comes to the digital euro, there's one idea for the offline option that is also about proximity um, to make this possible. So um, ideas, for example, for certain threshold amounts of money. But the question was, how can we get involved as civil society? Firstly, of course, through political parties. That's our way of political organization to also sh express our interests in this topic to say to the parliamentarians, members of parliament in Brussels, for us it's, in, it's important to make sure that this is shaped in a way that it's as anonymous as possible, that there are anonymous options, data saving options, so um, attention on the topic to make sure it's not a topic that is hardly mentioned at all, so really to draw attention to the issue. And then there are also civil society organizations, the NGOs that we have in Germany who are becoming more and more interested and involved in this topic and who can then determine the direction. At the moment, it's the banks mostly that are interested in the topic. It's this, it comes natural to them. 
and they also have maybe more possibilities to have an influence on the legislative process in Brussels. But to really draw attention to the fact that we are interested in what's happening in Brussels because it's so relevant for us as society that we want to make sure that the product is in our interest, so that is the first step. But our legislative possibilities go through the political process that requires attention and public debate and also discussion about money as a technology, which is something that concerns us all. That would be a first step in the right direction for me. But it seems like it's difficult to draw political attention to the issue. I'm, I don't know whether this is the case only in Germany, but um, for the past 15 years, we have not had a single political party that was seriously interested in the topic, maybe in the second or third row, but not in the front line, so to say. Yes, absolutely. Also now with the European elections, this was a topic that was not talked about at all. And I, I thought that was unbelievable. So yes, there is a fear of um, right-wing populists. There is a debate about people wanting to get rid of cash. And it's a cultural fight um, that you try to prevent instead of having an enlightened debate and an informed discussion. Uh, instead, people basically ca capitulate beforehand and say, well, we'll just drop the issue. So I've been here on the stage uh, trying to make sure that you understand that this topic is interesting. Um, but it, I also believe it's important that people gain everyday experiences with this topic. And I believe that's an access point for an entry point for discussion. So to show people it's a digital infrastructure we're shaping here and it's not about whether it will be highly successful successful when it's introduced in 2028, but will it be something that we use in 2035, 2040 that we can make good use of as a society. So this must be the timeline that we consider as a society, not in the very short term. You see our infrastructure here in Germany today. Too often we thought about infrastructure in the very short term and thought about will certain things work in two or three years. This could be an example where we have to think in the long term and differently from what we've done before. So I think we have to allow the future to, to be discussed and to happen. So now the floor is open to the audience. So there are lots of uh, people who want to ask a question. So the gentleman with the, with the hat and the glasses uh, can ask the first question, if I may say so. Hier vorne in der Mitte. Dankeschön. Dankeschön. Ja, mein Name ist Martin Zielinski. I'm Martin Zielinski. Thank you for the wonderful insights. Two questions. So I think in the last uh, 10 years uh, we've seen that the ECB policy with the zero interest um, policy can lead to some redistribution of money here to the benefit of the um, wealthier groups. Uh, and uh, so when we talk to politicians, I think an interesting question is how much can we actually achieve? You talked a lot about financial transactions, and uh, I would like to know, um, does the ECB intend to use the digital euro for fighting inflation, or is there also the threat of a redistribution of money? Uh, because those who can afford it can uh, buy a lot of uh, digital euros and you can do, probably do lots of more transactions with the digital euro if you have enough money. And um, another question, the digital money. So I think you somewhat touched upon that and you said that maybe regarding privacy, I just read an article on this wonderful payment card that is uh, being discussed for refugees, what you can uh, program into it, uh, like uh, a limit of 50 euros per month and also a limit uh, to where you can use it, limit uh, what you can buy with that. So all the requirements can be programmed into that. Uh, the limitations can be programmed into that. And with that, you can control people. And uh, as you said, this is all this is possible, digitally speaking. 
and uh, you said you cannot, one cannot um, actually um, control this institution because it's independent, but uh, uh, it can issue all these limitations. So redistribution and also social control, I think that's the two questions. Yeah, wonderful question. I'll start from the back end uh, with this um, payment card for um, uh, asylum seekers. So this is programmable money. With that, you can define what people are allowed to, to buy with that certain categories, says food, um, baby food, for example, alcohol, for example, one could say alcohol would not be allowed. And uh, so with a digital um, uh, central bank currency, that uh, would be possible in the same way, programmable money. But the ECB excluded that because they said we are not going to issue vouchers, we're going to issue money. And uh, I usually, usually have a look at these discussions, follow these discussions. It is one of the horror scenarios that is uh, raised again and again by very liberal groups because they say, we do not even want to run the risk that something like that is possible. And of course, therefore, you need the uh, need to exclude that through rules and uh, through technology or by design. But, uh, but uh, I want to say that simply because we have this technology doesn't mean that we have to use it. Um, in particular, if it's not wanted by an institution or by the government. But uh, with regard to this uh, uh, payment card for asylum seekers, uh, what I think is very uh, remarkable is that uh, uh, it was pretty clear for this uh, population group, nobody and nobody uh, were, came along regarding um, uh, well, the, the, the freedom of these people to spend the money as they want. Practical questions come up for like sports cl clubs who say, well, how do we want, how, how can can they pay us and, and so on. Uh, and um, with this group of the refugees, that is not a problem that is uh, discussed. So obviously, for certain groups, it is uh, deemed politically legitimate to program such uh, limitations. And for the broader public, it is not deemed acceptable. So programmable money is uh, something different um, compared to program programmable transactions. Um, so uh, smart contracts is one of the buzzwords here. That is something different. Uh, so, so combining a um, delivery with uh, payment, so that is a different uh, issue. Uh, well, the first question that you asked regarded uh, fighting inflation, and here the ECB made it clear at a very early stage that the digital euro is meant to be a payment instrument and not a storage media for a certain value. And that is uh, why... Um, the, the the amount of money that we could st store as as e euros uh, should is uh, the idea is to limit that to maybe three thousand euros so that it is uh, it is not possible to save a lot of money in digital euros at the same time the ecb also said that they do not want to use this as an instrument for monetary policy um, because they say this should be left to the banks in future as well. So this is part of the negotiations as to what is to be left to banks, um, for example, giving loans, uh, making, uh, giving uh, credits and so on. So much of that is to be left to the banks. So the digital euro is meant to be a payment instrument and not an instrument to save money to then be able to... Um, save larger amounts of money and then pay larger amounts of money. That is not the intention. So there's a person with a pair of glasses and my color of hair. And uh, I want to comment um, the words of introduction by Mrs. Hofmann. And I want to add or correct something. So the internet, as much as I know, the internet was not initiated here, but in the Podeville House. Uh, uh, there was a branch of, is of uh, the German Postal Services. I was there uh, personally. That was 1992, and that is when all this started. And I became internet addicted as a result of that, like Ms. Hoffmann. <coughs> no microphone. <laughs> Ich 
I think this is a misunderstanding. Um, and when well, somebody else um, wants to ask a question, yes, sir. thank you for the presentation, for the lecture. I'm interested in the um, term sovereignty and cryptocurrency. I think you explained the geopolitical situation very well, that uh, Europe lags behind regarding these payment systems. You explained the dependencies. And when we now um, decide for the digital, digital euro, which would be understandable from a geopolitical point of view, and uh, what if uh, um, cryptocurrency could be developed and used from Europe and developed in Europe that could then be used the world over. I think this sounds quite utopian, uh, but what is your comment on uh, this kind of um, option, namely to develop a cryptocurrency that could then be used everywhere in the world? Uh, cryptocurrency, but when you mentioned that, I think that is what I really like because uh, so money, creating money, and uh, um, the, was put on the agenda again uh, because it uh, um, showed that it is possible to create alternative forms of money. This is a kind of criti criticism of our current system. Well, what this has, what this has now developed into, um, whether, um, and whether we can really say that we can do our shopping with that, I think we are still far away from what the initial hopes were. So cryptocurrencies have become an investment issue, a speculation uh, issue. And uh, <clears throat> the success of uh, cryptocurrencies, uh, what is seen as the success of cryptocurrency, I mean, that so many people uh, deal with it. Um, at the same time, the cryptocurrencies have moved very far away from the original idea, namely to turn this into a kind of payment system. And But there are still ideas um, as to how one could do that, like coins um, by certain associations and uh, um, where a lot of uh, thoughts went into protecting the privacy, but uh, all this has not really prevailed because money is about more than just uh, privacy and technology. Money is about uh, trust. So what is a euro? I think we all trust in the euro having, having still some worth tomorrow. And and the experience has shown that it, we need these big institutions like central banks to actually um, bring this to life. And um, so I think these ideas are quite interesting to design money bottom up. But my impression, my experience is that this has always reached its limits very quickly. There have been some local initiatives, but uh, they have not really gone beyond that. Um, have I overseen some non-male persons uh, here? So any? So, so we still have some time left. I wanted to link up uh, to the Facebook example that you mentioned, and I wanted to add to that because, at the same time, Facebook. Uh, when it, this was about um, 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 the obligation of the state to provide uh, security, uh, uh, that they took some freedoms with regard to um, 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 uh, regarding security. And against that backdrop, I believe that uh, strengthening civil society um, is, is very important. I think the last elections in Europe show that uh, there is a loss of trust in the political parties of uh, in the democratic parties, basically. Uh, well, uh, in Germany, fortunately, not uh, um, not, not not really. Uh, um, the right-wing populism, because the FD has uh, remained below um, their own expectations, and uh, um, in particular uh, regarding young people, uh, um, some of them voted for um, in the AFD, but many of them also uh, voted for Volt. Um, they have increased their their um, their votes. Um, 
so coming back to the money, this uh, brings me to the, 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 the word trust, the Chaos Computer Club, with regard to fighting crime, fighting crime in the digital uh, sphere. The Chaos uh, Computer Club cooperated for a long time with the Federal uh, Office for Information Security. But um, a lot of mis distrust was uh, created, and therefore they suspended their cooperation with the uh, Federal Office for IT S Information Security. So uh, this had to do with data retention and uh, so on. Um, and there was uh, also a, um, a lecture at the Chaos Computer Club meeting, and that uh, was said that offline and online not only marginally, but what is your assessment? How can we implement that? So a two-channel or two-path system. So offline and online. So what what you said? Offline needs to be implemented as well. That is what you said. Hmm. So you can do that with, uh, so for example, <laughs> when you have no signal uh, at your local supermarket, which happens quite fast, you can uh, pay with, um, you can pay offline with American payment systems. It is possible. It's not uh, not a problem, technologically speaking, is it? Uh, looking at um, a colleague who is more of an expert in this field, but I'm not quite sure whether there are these offline possibilities already. Because that is something that uh, one now wants to uh, push forward with the digital euro. It seems that there are not yet uh, um, ready-made solutions for that. So the idea is that uh, it's similar to the amount of money that you've um, um, put on your um, smartphone or on your <laughs> debit card, when <laughs> the uh, older people among us still recall that, and to transfer this principle to your smartphone, that you have a kind of um, money stored on your smartphone. And then this would f function offline as well. Then the transaction should uh, be possible. Would be, yeah, should be possible to have this transaction then registered on the smartphone. As but my smartphone doesn't really function when I'm offline. So maybe it functions in Switzerland. Um, well, opening the rental car is more difficult. This doesn't function via Bluetooth. You need an online connection for that. So one more question from the audience before we uh, finish. Uh, so at least, and there's one lady who also wants to ask a question so to make sure that we do not have an all-male um, um, round of questions here. A very interesting um, presentation, but I'm still a bit confused. Part of the confusion is the title, namely Money as a Digital Technology. Uh, uh, which differs from digital technology as money. And the central banks do not uh, create money, uh, but um, creating money is left to the private banking institutions. Uh, so, so, so the money having um, 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 real world uh, guarantees um, this link has been, um, um, or this has been decoupled, and uh, uh, we, and we've seen that it is possible to become very rich by fraud, um, white collar fraud, and uh, so, um, and I asked myself uh, when Instex was uh, um, um, was uh, created to circumvent the extraterritorial sanctions against uh, Russia. Uh, and uh, why, I ask myself, why 
um, wasn't possible if you have two business partners, two banks who agree that they say that so and so many euros is trans transacted from here to there and then gas or oil is imported from Iran. Why does it uh, play a role that uh, uh, SWIFT has to agree to that? And uh, that is, shouldn't be necessary if you trust, if such two banks would trust each other. And trust is a constituent element here, and therefore I'm a bit confused. So I want to fight this um, confusion. So creating money. And this is um, done with private banks when they give out loans. So this is something that is a given, namely that uh, the uh, value of the digital euro, the, uh, the dig so the digital euro has the same value as the euro in my wallet, in contrast to the cryptocurrency. So the cryptocurrency only exists in a digitally. So cryptocurrencies are genuinely digital and cannot leave the digital sphere. But the idea is here to maintain this um, coupling. So the real euro that uh, circulates should con continue to have its, this link to the digital euro. So this is not, a, so it's, uh, the discussion is not about the value in itself, but uh, so it's not a decoupling, but uh, it's um, thinking about these two kinds of euros uh, together. This link is to be maintained in order to transfer this trust from the real world into the digital world. And with Instex, and that is very interesting, because not every bank in the world cannot connect, send money to every other bank in the world, because many banks are not connected. So I'm not uh, speaking about uh, correspondent banking banks here. But they correspond, they interact uh, via networks, via hubs, so to say. So I think mon the money system, the financial system, is not like the postal system that everybody has an address, but that the, these links are visible only via the system. So if it wasn't for SWIFT, banks could send uh, money only via the postal system. So there are no other communication systems. One could send fax, for example. Uh, so welcome to Germany. And <clears throat> so there are no other efficient, safe communication channels. Some alternatives were t tried, but Instex doesn't allow transborder transactions, but they only allowed a certain exchange mechanism, namely the bank in Germany that has the money in Germany. Um, so the German, uh, the German uh, players uh, interacted among themselves, and the Iranian inter uh, players interacted among themselves in order to avoid the trans the cross border interaction. So is there a kind of colonial matrix behind this communication system behind the um, banks? And that is why the system is, the, the, the motivation in China is very different and the uh, motivation in Africa is also very different. Uh, it's more of an, um, inclu a matter of inclusion. So there's another, there's one lady who wants to ask a question. And it's a very brief question indeed. Prepaid cards, how are they protected in cases of bankruptcy? We didn't catch the question acoustically. How are prepaid cards protected against bankruptcy? Well, the prepaid card has a certain credit amount on the card, and when that credit amount has been used up, are you talking about debit cards, maybe? So, the cards as vouchers that you give away as presents, well, then the, there's a certain amount of money on the card, the electronic card, and it doesn't matter whether the provider 
files for bankruptcy. So you need to have the possibility to use up the amount of money that is credited to the card. So I think bankruptcy, that would really have to do with the issuer of the card, that you that the money is no longer accessible electronically. Um, I think that's what happens. A very specific question. And at the end, to conclude our discussion, I want to take a bird's eye perspective on the phenomenon of European infrastructure that has been discussed in many other areas, the cloud that didn't work, um, high, that is, but let's look to the European Central Bank. So when the digital euro comes, the ECB will play a completely different role, maybe a more powerful role than before. And going back in history, there has been a lot of criticism about the ECB, I'd like to paraphrase Josef Vogel, a literature critic who has dealt with money and capital for a long time. And yeah, so in the 1960s, there were informal meetings between banks, central banks, that uh, invented the ECB without the public knowing this and integrated them into the Maastricht Treaty, Ludwig Erhard, in 1948. He said um, that only here on the free market the government finds the moral justification to speak and act on behalf of the people. Josef Vogel called the uh, European Central Bank the last instance of government. So this bank that doesn't really have a democratic legitimization when it comes to its foundation and establishment. And now it is becoming even more important, playing an even more important role. So what has to happen until in a player of this scale is being controlled itself and subject to democratic processes that would now have to happen? That's absolutely right after the financial crisis. The European Central Bank was its value was really increased. Josef Vogel described this very well. And there was also this drew a lot of criticism, of course, that um, it's not a democratic institution, that it has no democratic legitimization. And that is, of course, an aspect of, your, of a central bank that it's independent of a what happens at the political level. So this is somewhat a contradiction about central banks. At the same time, now it's about saying, OK, what would be, A, the scenarios where political decision makers change? Um, maybe some would like to see more political control and surveillance. So to make sure that an instrument cannot be used for political purposes, but at the same time, also not by the actor, the ECB itself. So to take precautions, introduce audits, uh, critical questioning. So the ECB, for example, has to answer to the European Parliament to really strengthen that and reinforce that um, critical feedback and control loops. So to uh, ensure democratic control is maintained, and that is a question and a legitimate point of criticism about central banks. How can we have, how can we exert an influence? Um, how are they legitimized to do what they're doing? But, and I don't want to open Pandora's box here, but for the European Central Bank, I think this the Digital Europe is such an exciting project because it's about a different aspect and opens a door to a different aspect. Before, it was always about banks and their monetary policies that are in communication, um, that is reflected in their circles, and there's a response to that. But now with the Digital Euro, the European Central Bank has become aware that it, this is targeted as, as, at a different audience, European politics, but also the European public at some point. 
where there is one, because there's we have the national states, of course. And then to think, so how can we, how can we do that? How can we convince the European uh, European public? And um, this is new for them. They have never done this before. Now they have to be in a dialogue, indirectly at least, with the people on the streets. So it's a challenge for them. And I think that's very exciting and interesting to see that the central bank that you described very well, this high tower in Frankfurt, that is somewhat in contrast to the other banks in, in architectural contrast, that this bank now has to address the European public in a new way. And this is a process that's starting now. So of course, there's the aspect of control, supervision. And then another aspect is also has the relationship between us citizens and the European Central Bank changed because with this new instrument, it becomes a much more important part of our everyday life and much more tangible. So that will also change our relationship. So the ECB has to learn, and for the first time, has to learn from uh, social scientists like you, Ms. Westermeyer. So I don't know how you feel about that, but I do believe that I will use cash more to pay for things in the next days if you can make this possible in Berlin at all because things have changed in Berlin and it's become harder to use cash. But now you didn't have to pay anything for the snacks that, and drinks that will be available outside in the hall. So thank you very much for joining us here. Thank you for Carola Westermeyer from, for coming here from Darmstadt today. Thank you.